Well, greetings, Oakwood. Last week, we went through the first three verses of Psalms 84. In Psalms 84, what did we see? We see the psalmist longing to go to the tabernacle of the Lord. The psalmist has a heart desire to be in fellowship continually with God. He longs for it. He yearns for it. He desires for it. That's his goal. That is his focus. That is his hope. And I said, uh, that should be us. We should have that same desire to want to go to church, to fellowship with the other saints, like-minded people, worshiping and serving our God. That this should be the attitude of our heart. Now, the psalmist now, in verses 4 to 7, which I will not read um, altogether. I'll just go through it verse, verse by verse, so follow with me. Although he cannot be constantly at the tabernacle, one thing he can do, and what we can do as well, is draw our strength from God in this life and also in times of difficulty. We can draw our strength from the Lord. So look at verses 4. It said, Blessed are those who dwell in your house, ever singing your praises. Selah. Now, blessed, this word is used three times in verses 4, verses 5, and then verses 12. And it describes the happiness of those who, like the sons of Korah in uh, 1 Chronicles 9 and 27, lodge uh, about the house of God. Now, you have to see the psalmist here, um, at least in the previous verses, is jealous of two birds, as I said last week. The sparrow, who finds his home in the tabernacle, and the swallow, who flies about but always lodges in the tabernacle as well. And he's jealous. He's jealous. He wishes he were like them that he could always be there. So when we see in this word, in this verse, um, the word dwell, those who dwell, dwell means to continually continually live. David is speaking of how blessed are those who never have to leave the temple. David went from envying the birds living in the tabernacle to envying the priests who had rooms at the house of God. He felt that they could live a life of constant praise. That's why I said they will still be praising you. He said, he thought that, wow, they get to be in the tabernacle ever praising God. They can praise the Lord all day long. Now, there is something about church or about the tabernacle in this case that causes us to want to worship and praise God. Of course, you can praise and worship him wherever you are, but there is something special about believers going to the church with each other. There is something amazing that happens when you enter into the church, into the life of the church, and you see people, and you're with people, and you're all focused solely on God, that there's something that happens with you in your life. That there's strength that comes from this. Now, I'll be honest, you know, doing these recordings on the laptop are very, very difficult. And there's a few reasons. One is because uh, communication, they say 55% of communication is eye contact. So when I preach, I'm able to scan the audience and I'm able to make eye contact with certain people. And in a sense, you see that, hey, uh, uh, the congregation is getting it or they may not be getting what I'm saying. I, I, I can look at faces and say, hey, emphasize this point a little bit more so they can get greater um, understanding or get off this whole topic because for some reason it's not resonating with people. Um, that's the benefit of eye communication. Eye to eye. I get, I get to look at you guys and I get to see. But also, you know, there's something uh, about um, being in church preaching. You know, I, I may prepare a sermon. Sometimes I, I, I'm trying to figure it out as I prepare it, as, as I'm going along. Sometimes sermons resonate with you more than others. Sometimes it does not. But when you go into the church, you, uh, I may not be um, ready to, per, to preach a sermon because, they're, they're, you know, you could be tired. You could have had a rough week. You, you may have had a negative conversation, a negative experience that kind of downs the mood to be able to preach. 
or I may be preaching from a passage that is so theological that I know it may make people fall asleep, but I have to be faithful to the text. But what happens is when you get into the church and then you see somebody, somebody says hi, and then, then you start talking to them about their week and you, and you hear from them and you tell them about your situation, then somebody else comes in and they give you a hug and, and uh, there's a warmth beginning to develop with people. Especially when you go up to preach and then there's music, there's, there's worship music and you're singing and you're praising God. So now all the problem that, that I may have gone through or all the concerns that are on my mind are kind of diminishing now because the focus is on God and uh, I'm worshiping and I'm seeing the church worship. There may be a song that is really working and resonate with the, with people's experiences and then you could see it. That, that, that does something to you there. There's a motivation that, that happens by that. And then we go through our time of prayer, and, and, and I'm praying for you, and, and I know you guys are praying for me as well, and we're calling out to God. Something is happening. We're building um, each other up in the Lord. You know, there may be a special song that is sung that resonates with our experience as well. Um, then scripture is read. So by the time I get up to the, to the pulpit, there's, there's something that has already happened throughout the experience where – once when I was not motivated, but now as soon as I come to the pulpit, um, the energy is there, the fire is there. But you can't necessarily do that in a um, sitting through a laptop, um, speaking to you guys. In, in a sense, in my mind, I have to imagine seeing individuals, um, certain people, uh, to be able to continue to speak like this. Hey, so there are some pastors that love doing stuff like this. Well, I'm one that find it very difficult. I'll, I'll give it my best, but it is, it is difficult. But there's something about being in church, as I said, um, where we could draw on each other for strength. And that's what we will see in these verses, in, the, in verses 5, verses 6, and verses seven, 7, that our strength comes from God. Our strength is solely coming from God that enables us to make it in this Christian uh, journey. Now, I want to ask you a question. When you get into difficulties or troubles or problems or you are under pressure, where is your strength? Have you found that your strength is in God or is it in something else? Well, look at what the psalmist says in verses 5. Blessed are those whose strength is in you and whose hearts are the highway to Zion. Did you hear that? Whose strength is where? Whose strength is in you. In other words, blessed is a man who gets his fulfillment and gets rejuvenated when he worships God. Blessed is a man whose highlight of the week is when he gets to worship God. Blessed is a man who is gratified and satisfied by God rather than by something else. Now, let me ask you another question. What do you chase after to get satisfaction and fulfillment in life? Is it shopping? Is it working your job? Is it spending time with family and with friends? Is it reading a book? Is it cooking? Or do you get this by listening to music? Now, understand this. None of these things are bad. All of them are good. But none of them will satisfy you and give you strength in life like worshiping God. And if you are not getting fulfilled by worshiping God, first you have to check yourself. But if you are not getting fulfilled by worshiping God, you will end up turning to something, uh, something other than God. And that in itself will never satisfy you. The man who finds his strength in God is those who, whose hearts are on a pilgrimage. They're on a journey. The Christian life is a journey. Now, this person does not rely on self or the world for strength, but considers himself a visitor, a traveler, a pilgrim in this world. His true strength and treasures are not in this world, but are in the world to come. And you'll, you'll hear me say this often, even in this sermon. Those who are frustrated in life sometimes have their their eyes on the wrong thing. Their eyes are on the things of this world. The strength and the heart of a pilgrim 
are displayed by the love for the house of God. Now you have to ask yourself, and you and you could only you're the only one that could answer this. Do you long to be with the saints of God? Do you long to go to where we worship? Uh, that's where we call church, even though we are the church individually. But when we gather together, uh, do you long to assemble with other believers? If you don't desire that, you have to check to see if you're even a Christian at all. True Christians long to, to assemble with each other, to fellowship with each other, to worship God with each other. It is in these premises or these facilities that we meet with God along with other pilgrims and that we gain strength in God together as we meet. You know, that's what the Bible says. As iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. The, the whole idea is when we come together, we affect each other's lives. The love and the longing for the house of God are not meant as an escape from the world, but as a, pre a preparation for life in the world. But it's interesting that the psalmist said, adds, in whose hearts are the highways. Now, you have to take out the word to Zion, because they are not in the original Hebrew. So what kind of men are these with, with highways in their hearts? Now. All through scripture, you will find references to highways. And they always refer to what men do in their lives to prepare the way for God. To give God access to all areas of their lives. This is interesting. They give access to God to all areas of their lives. So you have to ask, does God have access to all areas of your life? But you would remember when John the Baptist came preaching before Christ, it was said that he fulfilled the words of Isaiah 40 when it says, A voice cries in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for God. The prophet also described how this would be done. Every valley shall be lifted up, and every mountain and hill shall be made low. The even ground shall be, become level, and the rough places are plain. That is what is described in Psalms 84. Men and women who know how to build in their hearts a highway for God. So how is this done? Well, that's a good question. When you get into the valleys, you bring them up to the level by trusting in God. Yes, when you get into the valleys, you bring them up by trusting in God. Every valley shall be exalted. And when you get to a mountain of difficulty, or when you find yourself lifted up in pride or self-conceit, you judge it in the light of God's word and you bring it low. Every mountain shall be made low. Thus, you make a highway for God to travel in blessing, not only in your heart, but also in others. So this pilgrim, so the Christian, their strength is in God, and they have made a highway by which God can work in their lives, in, in the valleys and in the mountains. So you have to ask yourself, is your heart a highway that God can work in the valleys of your life? And God can work in the mountains that you find yourself on. Those who understand their own weaknesses are more apt to, to depend on the Lord for strength. You, you understand that, church. It is in your weakness that you're able to depend on God for strength. Because you know you cannot do it yourself. How many of you, be honest with yourself, or found yourself trying to accomplish things on your own, in your own strength, in your own ability. And over and over and over again, you have failed because you're trying to do it in your own strength. But it's in your weaknesses that you find yourself running to God and saying, I can't do it. God, help me. 
You know, that's what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 12 and 9. He says, my grace is sufficient for you. This is what God is saying to him. For my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, Paul says, I will boast all the more gladly of my weakness so that, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Oh, isn't that amazing? Ask yourself, in this time of drawing on God's strength that we should be doing, do you actually do that? Do you draw upon God or do you, do you use your own resources? Are you more apt to get on the phone or find some other means to solve your, solve your problems? Or do you go to God? And also ask yourself this, is your heart a highway in which God can govern and control your life? That God can bring the valleys up, the dark times, the difficult times, the times of depression, that God can, can bring it up? Or is your, your heart a mountain in which God can make low those times of also difficulty, but in those times of pride? Self-sufficiency that God, God can bring it low. See, this is, we need as a church to be able to draw on God for strength. Look with me at verse 6. It says, as they go through the valley of Baca, they make it a place of springs. The early rain also covers it with pools. Now, we are not exactly sure where the valley of Baca was located or what its significance is. Now, some think uh, the valley of Baca means the valley of rain due to springs of water that were there. Some think it means the valley of weeping because it might be where Israel wept in Judges chapter 2 when confronted with their sin. Now, others think it's a dry valley that developed pools during the rainy season. But no matter which interpretation we choose, the point of the landmark is clear. As you know, Israel in general is a very dry country. Roads get hot and dusty, and travelers get very thirsty. So whether the Valley of Baca is an actual valley with pools of water in it, or a dry valley that develops pools, or it is a historical point of interest along the road, the Valley of Baca was an area of refreshment and remembrance for all that God had done and all the ways he had blessed them. It is the same for us in the journey of the Christian life. There are times in life when we feel all dry inside. We are empty of joy, and we feel like a parched desert. Now the truth is, we go through this many times in our Christian journey. There are times that you're going to feel dry. There are, are times then when you are going to lack joy, and you're going to feel um, uh, demotivated. You may not even feel like a Christian in those moments. And normally when people feel dry and empty, they stay away from church. They say, I don't feel like worshiping God. I don't feel like God is doing anything. I just need some time to myself. I just need some time to get away. I just need to, to reflect. I just need to sit back for a moment and stay away from church. But that's a problem. Because these dry times in our lives are when we most need to be in the church. When you are experiencing a lack of joy. When you are experiencing dry seasons in your Christian life. You must find yourself in the very center of church. It is not time to retreat. If you stay away from God, you will get even drier and drier. If you determine to go through the valley of Baca, you will find a refreshing outpouring of the Spirit of God. You know what you get in church? You get praying. You get singing. Hear the word. You get fellowshipping with other Christians, which will be like water to your soul. Something happens when we come into the presence of God's people. We receive an answer to prayer. We have a, a, a meaningful time of worship or devotion. 
or we remember a time in our life when we sense God's hand at work, and these things are like springs of water in our life. They quench our thirst and give us encouragement to spur us on to continue on the journey. The dry times in your life, if you engage in these activities, will suddenly diminish. The rain will come and the wells will overflow. When you feel spiritually dry, you need to spend time in prayer and time in church and more time in the word than usual. You need to throw yourselves into these things because these things will give you refreshment and will be like rest stops on the road. You know how it is when you are going on a long journey that they have these these stops on the road where you could go and and stretch your legs, you could go to the washroom, you could buy some food. See, when you engage in these kind of activities, when you are praying, when you're spending time in the Word, when you're in the church, when you're in the fellowship of people, there are times of, of refreshment for you. They, they are like stops in the road. And that's what is alluded to in uh, verses 7. The writer, of Psalm, the, the writer of the psalm tells us, that the long journey to Jerusalem is made up of these little rest stops on the road. And he calls them uh, places of strength. Look at verse 7. It says, they go from strength to strength. Each one appears before God in Zion. Now the phrase strength to strength refers back to, the, to the, uh, that same word in verses uh, 5 of strength. And in the context of verses 6, the idea is that on the road to Jerusalem, they go from rest stop to rest stop, from point of refreshment to point of refreshment. And it should also be the same for the Christian. The road of life is hard, and the Christian life is harder still. Things do not um, necessarily become easier when you become a Christian. And we must understand that. And we must not give people false hopes that Christianity all of a sudden solves all of your problems. It does not. That is why so many Christians fall out of the race and stop living the Christian life. Because they've been given the wrong idea and the wrong perspective of Christianity. So they burn out. Or they get too weary to, to, uh, to fight the battle. And they fall to the wayside. And that is so tragic when such things Uh, like this happened because they're given the wrong idea of Christianity. But I believe that it all could have been avoided if they just did what the psalmist mentions here. Most Christians who fall away do so because they fail to go from strength to strength. They fail to stop at the rest stops. They fail to stop and fill up their gas tank. They fail to stop and get refreshment for the journey. And if you take the Christian life one day at a time, one step at a time, and go from one answered prayer request to another, from uh, from one um, time of Sunday fellowship to another, from one blessing of God to another, from one good Christian friend to another, from one prayer partner to another, when you go from strength to strength, you will look back over your life and be amazed that you have come so far. You know, a friend of mine recently told me of a time that they were going through a hard time in their life. And they, they went to a special service on a Saturday night because the church was having like a concert. And somebody spoke uh, and gave a testimony of the exact same situation they were going through and how God resolved it. That's what I call going from strength to strength. You do not detach your things from the things of, yourself from the things of God. You go to the things of God, and in the things of God, God ministers to you. It is in reading the Word that you could read a passage of Scripture that answers the situation that you're, you're going through or gives you encouragement during the trial of your life that you're going through. You may be in church, and they may um, sing a song, and that very song speaks to your life and speaks to your situation. Or somebody may come up to you and say something. They may speak a word that is relevant. They may speak a word that they don't even realize um, is from God to you. 
They are just saying something, but they don't realize that it is a word from God to you. Or somebody may call you over and say, can I pray for you? And they pray your exact situation. You see, this is how you go from strength to strength. You go from strength to strength, uh, from running towards the things of God, instead of running away from the sins of God. You find your strength in the house of God with, 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 with fellow believers, listening to the word. And it's so funny because many times I've preached sermons and people have come up to me and said that they needed to hear that. Um, they were going through um, a situation and what I said in, in that part of the sermon was exactly what they needed to hear. So church, you don't, when, when you are going through dry times, you find yourself connected to God and not disconnected from God. And you know, and the ultimate destination is to prepare, is to appear before God in Zion. As they traveled, they kept their eyes fixed on the goal, worshiping God in the Temple Mount of Zion. In the Temple on Mount Zion. That, that's, that was their goal. That's where they fixed their eyes. And we too, as we journey through life, must keep our eyes on the goal. The New Testament tells us to focus on Jesus. And to have that eternal perspective where we know that this world is not our home and that all we do should be done in light of eternity. That's why Oakwood's statement is eternity matters. It's not about the things in this world. It's not about things here. And half of our struggle in the Christian life, half of our struggle in the journey is because our eyes are not fixed on Jesus. Our eyes are fixed on other things. So life becomes difficult and we become weary in this Christian journey because we are not seeking the Christian journey. We are seeking other things. We, our eyes are focused on what we could obtain or the better job or the better education or, you know, or this, this better plot of land that we want. It's all material, nothing eternal. If our eyes were fixed solely on Jesus, even our illnesses, even our sicknesses would, make, would matter nothing to us because we know our home is not here. You know, uh, this, this whole idea of appearing before for Zion is what Paul is kind of alluding to in his writing in 2 Corinthians 5 and 10 when he says, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. We know that wherever he went, where uh, whatever he did and said would all be assessed when he stood before Christ. And he kept laboring, he kept serving, he kept striving, he kept running because he wanted to be bold and confident and unashamed before Christ at his coming. And we should too. We should have all these elements that Paul had. We should keep striving, keep running because we don't want to be ashamed in front of Christ um, when we stand before him. So are you dry? Uh, do you feel like you are dis disconnected spiritually? Do you feel that God is somehow far away from you? Uh, are you unmotivated? I know we're in a pandemic, but are you at the phase in your life where you couldn't even care if you went to church or not, or you, you care not to read the Bible, you care not to, to pray or engage in God's word or fellowship with the saints or anything like that? Are you at that stage? Well, if you are at that stage, I'm going to tell you that if you keep going, if you connect with God, connect with him in his word, call up a fellow believer, connect with him in prayer, engage in these spiritual disciplines, your, your soul will be refreshed. You, you, um, you, you will again be motivated to engage in the things of God. It is like a marathon runner. You know, they're, they're running the long distance and there's people at the side um, of the road and they have those water cups out or water bottles out and you see individuals grabbing them and, and drinking to refresh and they throw it down and they keep running and they get to a next part and there's people with water and they grab it and uh, uh, drink it, refresh and they keep running. That's what we need to do. That's what these spiritual disciplines do. Don't ever disengage yourself from the house of God. As we see uh, from the last sermon that, that the psalmist wanted to be in the house of the Lord. He was envious of the birds. 
Oh, Jesse, his whole goal was to stay in the house of God forever if he could. But you know what? He realized that he couldn't. He realized that that's unrealistic. But there's a journey in his mind. The journey was to get to the house of God. Now, our journey is to get home with God, to be in heaven, to be in fellowship with God. But guess what? The, the bottles of water are, are, are held out to you. You have to grab them or you'll be too weak for the journey. God has given us these opportunities to engage with him. So when you feel like you are disconnected from God, um, I'm going to tell you, listen, you have to engage somehow with these spiritual disciplines and you will be remotivated. And you'll find yourself back again in fellowship with God and his people. Okay, so we get our strength in the things of God. So this is what I'm going to propose to do. Since we are still not meeting in church and uh, you guys have agreed and voted that this is something that we should not do um, yet, I'm going to start a Bible study on Zoom. Uh, if you need help with how to um, get on Zoom and connect, yeah, you have to give me a call, and I will, I will I will help you with that. But I am thinking either Tuesday or Wednesday we will start a Bible study, and we will do it every week at about seven o'clock. Now, if you are interested in this, I'm going to have another box below that I'm going to ask you for your name and your email. Um, that says you will be a part of this. Now, the reason I need your email is not that I'm just soliciting for your information so I have it and I can spam you. No. I have to send you out the link for Zoom so we could all come on together. I'm thinking of starting this now either on the 22nd or the 21st. I just need to know first if you are willing. And if you are willing, the next week in my sermon, I will give you the exact date and exact time. So Tuesday or Wednesday. So um, lock those times off and I will tell you next week. And this is gonna be a great time that we actually get to see each other. Um, maybe it won't be physical, but we'll be able to see each other's faces. And we will go through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The resurrection. I think that would be great for us. If you're interested, put your name and your email. Um, I'm not forcing you guys. But I think this would be a good thing for us to be able to do as we are still not in church. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for the strength that you've given us and provide for us. We thank you that we can, uh, don't have to look towards ourselves because we are failures. We are depraved people. We are people in need of a Savior. We thank you for your work that you have done on the cross uh, for us, God. Oh, we truly need that work. And we thank you for your blood that, you were, that was shed on Calvary. God, if we had to look to ourselves, we would mess everything up. But thank you we can look to you for our strength for the journey. And God, let us engage in the things that are um, important uh, to you, that will build us up um, as believers, that we could go to these, these stops of refreshment along the road, that we could continue on in the journey. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, I'll quit. Next week. Bye for now.